Thank you very much uh, again for inviting me to speak on uh, this favorite topic of ours, uh, biomechanics of spine instrumentation and selecting spine instrumentation. Uh, as you know, it's such an uh, ever evolving field. Um, so I wanted to uh, start um, uh, by, by uh, uh, kind of basically going through uh, some very basic biomechanics. Uh, you heard some great uh, concepts shared by Dr. Cunningham, and uh, really he, uh, it, it would be uh, wrong to uh, uh, try to expand more given what the, the depth of what he described, especially for the lumbar sacral junction. But that then leads to what implants we consider for success, what the mechanisms of failure for uh, implants and instrumentations are, and then how we can improve our successful use of instrumentation in designing our, uh, our constructs and, and, and so on. So, um, so firstly, I wanna start with, with what the purpose of the spine is. Well, really uh, the spine, uh, it, it, it does many things, but obviously the first and foremost is that it protects those neural elements, which we know. Uh, it also stabilizes our external limbs and it really supports our entire axial uh, load uh, as well as our body weight. Mm -hmm. And of course it provides that stability for us to move, uh, which is such an important aspect of, uh, of, of what we do as human beings. So uh, essentially the purpose of instrumentation then comes into play when we need to obtain stability and stabilization across a range of different conditions uh, for uh, the treatment of, of uh, spinal disease. And that includes obviously from trauma where there's fracture and instability created all the way through deformity, through infection, where there's a neoplastic process, and to degenerative conditions where we have uh, pain generators, but they're part of this mobile spectrum uh, of the use of our spine. And the purpose of this instrumentation is really to act as a scaffold until such time as biological fusion and arthrodesis is achieved, whereby stability is achieved for the spinal construct. And, and the corollary to that is that, for example, in pediatric patients where our goals are achieved, either a fracture is, is uh, healed or biological fusion across a construct is achieved, sometimes instrumentation is able to be removed. And that's an important consideration, one, one that we don't consider enough in adult um, uh, spinal uh, treatments. So then what is the ideal instrumentation? What is it that we look for uh, when it comes to selecting our implants? Well, obviously it has to have adequate strength for it to do its job and not fail um, across multiple cyclical loads. It has to be able to restore normal alignment. And we'll, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but alignment is extremely important, not just for the goals of spinal pelvic parameters or quality of life indices, but also for duration and longevity of the implant and of the construct. Obviously it has to be easily inserted. Uh, it can't be difficult, uh, otherwise it has little practical use. It can't fail. It has to allow for correction in multiple planes and it has to have enough of a footprint to allow for generous fusion across uh, where the goal of arthrodesis is. And of course, in, in our modern day, it has to be cost effective. Otherwise our hospital systems uh, will not uh, tolerate it. So essentially uh, this leads to sort of this concept of, of the bi basic biomechanics of the spine as a cantilever. Uh, and again, this is kind of really uh, geared towards uh, my neurosurgical colleagues, our orthopedic surgeons, Rod, Rod was, uh, uh, very generous uh, to our orthopedic surgeons before, and I continue that. They, they're very uh, well versed in the concept of uh, uh, the biomechanics, particularly that of the cantilever. And I just kind of want to really emphasize this because it's basic, but, it, but it, 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 it transcends all aspects of instrumentation. The spine is, if you like, uh, a, a cantilever construct. And that is also the case with instrumentation. If you like, there are these longitudinal members, which are the rods that we place. Uh, there is certain stress and force that is applied vertically throughout the longitudinal members. And then we have anchors at each segment in the spine, which if you like, 
are the the uh, are, are the surrogates are the pedicle screws that we put in to achieve our spinal construct cantilever design. And essentially, uh, when we have that construct, then as you can easily imagine, there is increasing force in the form of an axial load that is applied from the skull all the way down to the lumbar sacral junction. And that is this applied load or axial loading force. And it's resisted by this sheer force or resistive force. And this, uh, in, in, in normal Newton's law of physics, when these forces are equal and opposite to each other, they cancel e each other out and stability is achieved. But uh, we also have a, uh, if you like, a instant instantaneous axis of rotation uh, or a fulcrum around which these forces meet. And there is a rotational force that's created called a moment. And in the form, uh, and, and in spine, it's known as the bending moment of the spine. And the instantaneous axis of rotation is a name we give to this rotational axis around this bending moment in the spine. So if you look at this construct, uh, the, the, like I said, the, the rods act as a longitudinal member. The screws act as this load bearing beam across which there's both the applied force and the resistive force. And then you have this bending moment or rotational force around this axis of rotation, which is the ful fulcrum. Uh, and, and this force applied uh, to this construct creates this moment. So why is this important? Why do we care about this? Well, we care about it because of the concept of the, the practical implications of what it means. So you've heard this uh, concept before, no doubt. I know Dr. Chapman's spoken about it many times before, and that is that a deformity can actually beget a deformity. And what do we mean by that? We mean very simply that as an axial load is applied, as, as we said before, we create this rotational force called the bone bending moment around that axis of rotation. Now imagine if you have kyphosis where there's increased distance between the fulcrum and the tip of where that force is applied, not as a surrogate, the tip of the screw or the deformity itself, then what happens is that the bending moment is a result of the force that's applied and the distance from the fulcrum to the tip of, its, of, its, uh, uh, of the force applied, then that creates a larger moment that leads to a larger bending moment which increases kyphosis. And then you create a vicious cycle where you start with a uh, region of kyphosis and over time, unless it's corrected, it leads to further and further kyph kyph kyphotic deformity. And the way to correct that obviously is to reduce the distance between the fulcrum and the tip of the deformity. And that is the whole purpose of deformity surgery or, or alignment correction. So that then translates well into the co concept of stress and strain. And again, really, our, I think our orthopedic colleagues really understand this very well. So for, for me, it was uh, an education, if you like, to, to really understand these points. But, but stress, if you like, is that force. Uh, and it is a unit because it's force per unit area uh, measured typically in humans in mini pascals. And the stress can take different vectors as well. It can be... Uh, tensile, which means it can be a distracting force, it can com be compression, which we understand very well, or it can be at an angle uh, and form a shear force. And then the strain is a response, a deformation response to that stress force on an object, whether it be a bone or an implant or whatever it is. Uh, it lacks a unit, it's measured in a ratio, it reflects the force resisting ability of that bone or implant to all of the stresses that we talked about. And then this is the important curve to take away from, from this point. You, you have a region, a, a linear segment, if you like, between a points B and C in an implant or in the bone, where a stress that's applied is proportionately reflected in a deformation. And there is the ability of reverse, there is reversibility across this, across this uh, range. And this range, this, this, this slope that's created between the stress and the strain is known as the uh, elastic zone or, or, uh, and, and the slope is the elastic modulus or the Young's elastic modulus. And it can be applied for any material. Um, after a certain point, the yielding point, 
then there is loss of the ability of the instrumentation, for example, to uh, retain its shape and it remains in the deformed position it's created and past a certain point, the failure point D, then there is either rod fracture or some kind of catastrophic failure, if you like, uh, based on the load that's applied. So what does that mean practically? It means that the, for the 21 year old healthy male, increased amount of stress is able to be tolerated uh, to a much higher degree compared to the osteoporotic 80 year old female, where a lower degree of stress will lead to that catastrophic, catastrophic point of failure that we talked about. And, and what that means is that we must understand the implant considerations and requirements to achieve a successful construct uh, in the range of these individuals. So we, we talked about the elastic modulus. We said that this is, if you like, a reflection of the ability of, of, of that implant or, or material to deform uh, according to the stress that's applied to it. Look where cancellous and cortical bone is. It is very low in terms of number. And then if you look uh, specifically at our implants, uh, stainless steel, cobalt chrome, ranging from 190 to 210. So there needs to be kind of a judicious selection of implants that's applied uh, to our bony requirements in order for it to both uh, be able to achieve integration with the bone, but also not fail, not either have the, 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 the cancellous or cortical bone fail or the implant fail as well. And titanium, for example, is something that's far more um, medium or within the closer to that of the Young's elastic modulus for bone itself. So these are some characteristics of, of, of implants, if you like. Uh, they, they sound like the Olympic games here of athletes, you know, there's ductility, there's brittleness, strength, fatigue, failure, um, notch sensitivity, toughness, roughness, and so on. Basically, they're all qualities of implants that are important in both their development, but also in their consideration uh, in, in, the, in their selection. And we'll cover that when we come to implants uh, briefly. Bone itself is also subject to these. We've talked about implants so far, but it has its elastic modulus. And it also depends on the direction of how stress is loaded. Because of the trabecular nature of bone, remember that there are fibers within these trabecular fibers that run longitudinally within the cancellous aspect of the bone, then it also resists uh, least in angulation and then a distractive tension and most in compression. So it's strongest in resisting compression. And that is also a consideration when we select an implant, for example, where we want to achieve compression uh, for arthrodesis compared to a distracting uh, force that would be applied because we know uh, that, that it's going to fail. And it's also a viscoelastic. It depends on the rate in which it's, it's loaded. A bone density changes with age, disease, and, and use. And it occurs along uh, a, a line of stress too. And, and remember Wolf's law, which says that uh, the greater the pressure that's applied to the bone, the better the ability for it to absorb that pressure and ultimately lead to arthrodesis. So then what does that mean in terms of our implants and, and the properties of our implants? Well, well, this is the easy stuff. You know, it's, it's understandable that our implants have to be inert. Obviously they can't be toxic and leach uh, toxins to the body. Uh, they have to be strong enough to be able to achieve the, the goal with which they're, they're um, given. They have to resist that fatigue across multiple uh, hundreds of thousands, millions of cyclical loads supplied to them throughout the course of a lifetime. They can't corrode. They have to be resistant to wear. And, and importantly, they have to be inexpensive for our use. So then what do we use commonly? Well, obviously, metal is, is the most common that, that we use currently for uh, spine instrumentation. And, uh, you know, this, this ranges obviously from uh, the old stainless steel to, to newer uh, titanium and, and uh, cobalt alloys. But there are also non-metals as well. Um, so in brief, stainless steel was the first uh, instrumentation metal that we used. Don't forget that there is a significant component of it, which is made up of nickel, 
uh, and that leads to kind of its, its allergic component. 316L is the most commonly formed that's used. Its advantages, it's extremely strong. It's very ductile. In other words, it has the ability to resist deformation uh, based on the load that's applied to it. It's very, very biocompatible. It does not really corrode. It does not uh, lead to uh, toxin release. It's very cheap. But of course, it has the disadvantage, a huge disadvantage of creating artifact on imaging. And, and this is uh, particularly important when it comes to assessment, for example, of the neural canal or uh, assessment of longevity, fracture, and so on. So then that led to uh, other alloys such as titanium, which is one that we, we use most commonly now. And, and TI-64 uh, is, is the most commonly used uh, component. Don't forget that it, 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 it's not just titanium and there's a vanadium component to it. And that's where the toxicity, the rare toxicity of titanium alloy uh, is appreciated, but it's extremely biocompatible and it is MRI compatible as well, which makes it hugely advantageous. Um, and uh, all, all of this adds to great use within the spine. It is, does have the disadvantage of being not sensitive. In other words, that when you come to bend it, um, there, there are, uh, if you like, uh, regions of stress deformation that are applied to the metal, uh, of which uh, this can lead to uh, subsequent fracture in the future. And then there's cobalt chrome, which again has the advantage of be being extremely strong. Um, it's extremely resistant to corrosion. The problem is that it's stiff. And so it's both difficult to deform for, for your needs, uh, and it's rigid and will really challenge uh, patients with poor bone density, for example, our osteoporotic patients at, at the uh, bone implant interface, where it's unlikely that the metal will fail, but the bone will fail. And we'll, we'll come across this uh, in an example. And then there are other uh, elements as well, uh, such as nitinol, which is the metal retaining uh, memory sh uh, shaping metal, uh, highly resistant to kinking, uh, but there are disadvantages to it. Peak, we, we heard a little bit about uh, not so much for rods, although you know there's a concept of dynamic um, uh, fusion at one point where uh, peak rods uh, were created, or there was a there was addition of peak to a metal rod, uh, but it's really in the form of an interbody that it's used right now, and uh, and and so on. So we're going to talk about kind of the the concept of screws as well. Uh, there is all of these aspects of these screws. They, they, there is an inner diameter. Uh, which is linked to its strength, if you like, uh, an outer diameter, the, the, the pitch between the threads, and they can be cannulated and coated with hydroxyapatite and so on for uh, adding uh, osseointegration. So the rods, we talked about it briefly before. Uh, I want to kind of emphasize this point. When you create a notching by bending a rod, you do create what's known as a stress riser. And at that point, that's a, a, a place of weakness uh, across which fatigue may develop over time, particularly across cyclical loads. So always select pre-bent rods if that's possible. Uh, and uh, it's less of an issue for cobalt chrome, um, much more so for titanium. And, and as we've learned with deformity surgery and so on, we now add additional rods such as a tri or quad construct uh, to overcome this particular weakness of, of titanium alloy. But this is an important point to remember for the selection of your longitudinal members. There are other uh, implants that we can put in uh, to achieve correction across a curve. Sublaminar wires are very useful for adding in additional anchors. Uh, they, they are particularly useful uh, for, for coronal uh, uh, corrections, uh, as well as kyphosis. Again, by pulling the spine to the, to the contoured rod, uh, the problem that they have is that they may cut bony elements because they're sharp. And of course, there's imaging issues. That led to the concept of a sublaminar tape, which distributed the load uh, across this kind of polyethylene uh, braided nylon um, uh, tape, if you like, and there was more broad contact and less cutout. So then that leads us to the concept of the inner body. Um, you heard about PEAK, uh, it's very popular. Uh, it's great in terms of the fact that its elastic modulus is most compatible with bone. It can be packed uh, with autogenous bone graft or osteoinductive agents. 
Here's the issue. It will never integrate into bone. You will never fuse uh, a peak into bone. And more than likely, a hydrophobic region will be created around the bone peak implant, which will actually uh, negatively impact arthrodesis and it will, it, it will repel arthrodesis at a cellular level, in the implant between peak and bone. Uh, there are other options such as coating, coating it with titanium, which may improve osseointegration, uh, but, but it is definitely not perfect. And then there's titanium, which readily uh, uh, integrates into osseous uh, bone. It can be modified for fixation. Uh, it's difficult to remove when fused. Uh, now, uh, more and more, we're creating porous titanium, such as through 3D printing, which allows modification of the surface, surface adaptation uh, to accommodate something such as you heard about macro, micro, but also uh, at a nano a level, theoretically, 10 to the power of minus nine. Uh, and then there are other uh, uh, implants as well, such as carbon fiber with a lower modulus to bone and, and so on. So let's talk a little bit about the concept of the screw because this this will help us understand uh, when we put these um, uh, these anchors in. The strength of the implant is related exponentially to the diameter, particularly the inner diameter of the screw, and it's to the power of four. So the greater the diameter, the much stronger the tensile strength of the screw. Now the pullout strength, which, which is the resistive ability of the screw to be pulled from uh, the bony interface, isn't just related to the, the sheer strength of the, met, of the material itself, uh, such as the bone uh, 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 metal interface, but also the area across where uh, the fusion, uh, if you like, is, is applied. And that's really the difference between the major and the minor diameter. The, the greater the difference, the greater the ability for there to be osseointegration across the screw and hence pull out. It's also related to the, to the amount of threads, to the frequency of threads of the pitch and the length of the screw itself. So let's talk about some screw failures. Um, this is kind of a major topic. You know, it, it deserves its own kind of lecture in itself. I, I just want to say that there's a whole classification system that's built around it, uh, whether it be plowing, where uh, there is a uh, failure of the screw, but within the cortical surfaces of the vertebrae itself, a pullout, a cutout, uh, loosening, and so on. And then there's implant failures. These are all uh, very much linked to both the selection, to the applied forces of, of the selected implant, and ultimately alignment in which uh, the, the construct uh, is, is made and the forces applied to that. So, for example, when we come to it, uh, we, we, we understand this is a very basic concept that where there is poor bone density, uh, it is the bone that fails uh, in terms of failing. Where there is adequate bone density, that, that is where the resistive forces will be applied to the metal and over multiple uh, cyclical loads, the metal is likely to fail. And then there's a the concept of cantilever bending as well here. Uh, let's just say that pedicles are much better areas to resist pullout compared to the vertebral bodies. And you heard yesterday about uh, the, the impact of plates, for example, in leading to coronal split fractures for this reason in itself. And I wanna end with this concept of, of the tips uh, because this is what's important to, to us, uh, especially for the, the residents and fellows as they learn these points for their training. Select the largest diameter to reach the cortical surface of the pedicle. Um, as Dr. Sanser said before, L5 has a wide pedicle. So if possible, don't select a 5.5 five screw, select a 6.5 or a 7.5 screw, because again, both the, the screw, the metal itself is likely to survive. But secondly, uh, there is greater integration with the bone and more likely um, uh, strength applied to failure of pullout uh, as it applies there. We talked about cortical screws before. Uh, there is greater pitch, and I think that that's one uh, major strength that we may not have mentioned. So increased threads, uh, but they capture the cortical screws. And you heard that in the upper lumbar spine, uh, regular pedicle screws in a way act like cortical screws anyway because of the smaller diameter of the pedicle. 
there really isn't any additional benefit past 50% uh, when it comes to size of the screw itself. Angulation, particularly triangulation, Dr. Cunningham mentioned this point as well, is particularly important. Add that angle to the screw construct and that will resist pull out. Tapping is important, particularly with dense bone. Yes, there is disadvantage in the sense that tapping will lead to some loss of both cortical and cancellous bone, but it will lead to a better channel for eventual placement and reduced micro fractures uh, with, with the ultimate placement of the screw. And that is my problem with the concept of the one, uh, one implant screw, a, a one technique screw, one pass screw or the speed screw or unilateral screw that's, that's placed uh, with minimal tapping and minimal preparation. And don't forget that you can augment uh, with cement, both in the vertebrae and in cannulated uh, screw, con uh, screw constructs through the screw itself. So in conclusion, there's really three considerations and goals. You have to understand the biomechanics uh, of what it is that you're applying a construct to and match the instrumentation to the conditions of the spine, particularly with bone density. And ultimately, if you want to reduce instrumentation failure, we've talked about this in many, many past lectures, alignment is key both to achieving good spinal pelvic parameters for the patient and quality of life in indices, but longevity of the implants itself. And your outcomes are best if you select the patient well, if your surgical strategy is robust, and that's why you're here at the course to, to learn, you, you learn that in the lab, and you maximize the instrumentation uh, that, that, that you select to achieve the goal that you want to. Thank you. Thanks, News. Glad you're well. Uh, a lot of information, short time. Uh, two rapid fire questions, and then I'll invite our wonderful audience who've uh, sat here with rat attention to go out, get a lunch, and we'll ask the next speaker to slowly start his next lecture with Dr. David Hanscom. Rapid fire questions. Dave, uh, so News, how much does a head, uh, normal sized adult human head weigh? Uh, how, how much is a, sorry, what was the question again? Well, your, your sound is off. Sorry, can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Yes. What's the weight of a human head? Well, I think uh, the, the human head can weigh uh, anywhere between, uh, with, with the brain, um, uh, five kilograms to 10 kilograms. Um, so uh, I'm going to go with that answer. Um, You're a neurosurgeon, you should know that. Yeah, right, exactly. Uh, so, so well, it depends, right? I mean, it uh, also depends on whether you include uh, spinal fluid uh, or not. Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's going to be my answer for it. Yeah, so, so I was always uh, 10 to 20 pounds, so we'll just agree on that. Mm -hmm. um, but the point is the following. When we do a cervical spine reconstruction, like what Isaac said before, very briefly, posteriorly, if we do a multi-level construct, 3.5 versus four millimeter rods. Yeah, for, for cervical, um, I, I, I uh, apply 3.5 millimeter rod constructs to cervical spine, uh, but I'm aware, and I keep that because when I need a rescue uh, situation, then I'm happy to increase that rod diameter uh, to, to 4 uh, But I, I, I want to keep that for the cervical spine because of the of the load that's applied, that rapidly increases uh, in the thoracic spine uh, to to a, a, a four five uh, or even a five five. So, next uh, question. So I'm cutting you off here. Uh, posterior construct crosslinks, yes or not? I you know I I, I learned uh, on crosslinks. I I think ironically um, across a long segment. Uh, there may be some advantage to them with instrumentation failure, past cases of instrumentation failure, uh, where uh, it may prevent uh, windshield wiping. But for regular uh, deformity constructs, I do not apply uh, crosslinks. And I think that is because the vertebrae themselves act as a crosslink. So if you have adequate density uh, across a vertebrae, why do you need a crosslink? So I, I would not place con uh, crosslinks. Uh, in a reasonably uh, dense uh, bone, particularly for long constructs. It's been a while since we've had uh, Nuj as a fellow here. Uh, Jerry, take a microphone. 
Yeah, a quick question on biomechanics. So one of the disadvantages you talked about with the one pass uh, screw is not tapping, I think you said. So do the tips that say that they're self-drilling or self-tapping, is there biomechanical evidence that that takes away that disadvantage or is that like some industry kind of bogus? Yeah, it, it's, it's very, that's a really good question. Uh, I, you know, theoretically it's meant to tap as it inserts, right? Uh, so it's meant to have that function. My, my, my problem isn't even so much with the tapping. The, I, my problem is the fact that there isn't enough channel created to accommodate a larger screw from the beginning uh, where uh, that, that screw is applied directly to the bone surface. So when I tap, I may lose a little bit of bone but what I do is that I allow a little bit of deformation for the bone to then accommodate a, a larger diameter thread to take up the bone. Um, I, I, I'm not aware of the uh, final data, if you like, across these kind of single step screws that are, that are placed. Uh, my personal experience has been that they've been disappointing. Uh, we've seen microfractures develop around them. Uh, but, you know, in terms of efficiency, of course, the concept is, is, is great. To me, it all, it's all about the bone density. Uh, if, there's a poor, uh, if there's great bone density, it makes sense for me uh, to want to wanna tap. And that's why with these cortical screws, where I'm capturing the cortex, uh, then I do like to tap before I uh, place the eventual screw. Um, and, and Dr. Chapman, I did say kilograms. So I think you, you'll find that we, uh, we're actually in agreement. So. Yeah, no, good. Uh, one more question. Mansoor has a question, so give this man a microphone. Hey, there's on these. For, uh, for cervical spine, fixed uh, uh, screws versus variable, is it top of the construct, bottom of the construct? Does it matter from a biomechanical perspective? A second thing that could top say hi to you. Yeah, that, this is, thank you. Um, uh, I, I think that you know, for, for me, it depends what the goal is. If, if the goal is to fix trauma where there's a fracture, I want to fix that construct. And so I will select fixed screws. I, I, I want there to be as little micromotion to improve my ability of arthrodesis. But for me, uh, for a degenerative case, then I prefer fixed, uh, typically at the bottom of that construct. Uh, and I do want some uh, variability, I and mean, I think there's a lot of data behind this. Uh, and so I will select variable implants at the top of a construct and, uh, and throughout and fix at the bottom because I expect there to be some degree of settling. Uh, and I think that this will lead to my best outcome. I fear with fixed screws in a non-traumatic construct uh, that there will be eventually some toggling of those screws and, and failure uh, not of the screws, but of the of, of the bony uh, in interface. Uh, so uh, so that's that's my personal preference uh, to use variable screws, except for uh, trauma, where I'll use fixed. I'm happy to include. We disagree on many subjects, but your uh, lectures are always wonderful and very well thought through. Thanks for joining us, and uh, hope you stay well.